The evaluation of temporal bone trauma has evolved quite a lot over the last decade, so we're going to look at some of the traditional ways of approaching temporal bone trauma and some of the more modern ways of doing so. Traditionally, we used a scheme which divided temporal bone fractures into longitudinal fractures, which run along the length of the petrous apex, versus transverse fractures, which run perpendicular to that across the petrous apex. This is useful because it's anatomically oriented, and longitudinal fractures tended to avoid the otic capsule, that is the dense bone around the membranous labyrinth, whereas transverse fractures tended to violate that otic capsule. But more recently, we've gone to a system of classification that skips the middleman and goes straight to the point we're trying to make, which is whether or not the otic capsule is involved in the fracture. So the more modern classification scheme is otic capsule sparing versus otic capsule violating. Always remember that when you see a mastoid or middle ear effusion or a pacification in the setting of trauma, that's really got to draw your eye to a temporal bone fracture. And when you're reading a head CT, for example, and you see that, that middle ear opacification, it might be time to recommend a temporal bone fracture, even if you can't make out that fracture on the thick cuts of a head CT, because those may not pick up subtle fractures, and that middle ear opacification or mastoid ear cell opacification is your clue, even on a head CT, that you're dealing with temporal bone trauma. Let's talk first about longitudinal fractures. They run along the length of the temporal bone, along the axis of the petrous apex, they tend to run through the middle ear cavity because that's the, the path of least resistance is to go through that open air of the middle ear. They often disrupt the ossicles. So if you're looking for ossicular dislocations, those occur in longitudinal fractures. Because of this, they tend to result in conductive hearing loss, uh, involvement of the middle ear, disruption of the ossicles, conductive hearing loss. But if the fracture line runs anteriorly to involve the geniculate ganglion, you can also get facial palsy. Uh, longitudinal fractures are more common than transverse fractures because they require substantially less force than a transverse fracture. The other type of fracture is a transverse fracture. These run across the width of the temporal bone perpendicular to the axis of the petrous apex. They tend to involve the inner ear, the otic capsule, because they've got no choice. They don't have that path of least resistance. They've got to go all the way through the petrous apex. They have to involve the uh, otic capsule. This can result in a perilymphatic fistula if the perilymph and endolymph that belongs in the membranous labyrinth leaks out into the middle ear cavity. They tend to result in sensory neural hearing loss because of the involvement of the otic capsule. And if that fracture line runs through the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, they can cause facial palsy. You see that this, the facial palsy, is in common between transverse and longitudinal fractures and is a frequently overlooked complication. Always remember to look for involvement of that fallopian canal that contains the facial nerve when you're evaluating temporal bone fractures. Transverse fractures are less common than their longitudinal counterparts because they require a ton of force. Fracturing the otic capsule is a big deal. It requires a ton of force. So a transverse fracture is indicative of high force trauma. You need to be worried about other issues such as blunt cerebrovascular injury when you see a transverse fracture. I like to categorize every fracture of the temporal bone as either longitudinal or transverse. Um, usually they're not perfectly aligned or perfectly perpendicular, but if they're close, they can fall into one of the two categories. Every once in a while, though, you get one of these fractures that's just halfway between longitudinal and transverse. It doesn't fit neatly into either category, and so you can use the term oblique fractures, although I try to avoid it as much as possible. Now, the more modern terminology for temporal bone fractures is otic capsule sparing and otic capsule violating.
As you saw from our previous discussion, the purpose of, of categorizing fractures as longitudinal and transverse is kind of to get at this concept of whether you're more likely to have sensory neural hearing loss because you violated the iota capsule or whether you're more likely to have uh, conductive hearing loss because you went through the middle ear instead. Well, this new terminology sort of jumps straight to the point and says, look, is the iota capsule involved or not? This also gets around the problem of oblique fractures, which kind of uh, can behave either way. And even if it's an oblique fracture, you can still classify it as iota capsule sparing or iota capsule violating. Now, don't forget in this system to keep an eye out for those facial nerve involvement um, because all of these fractures can still involve the facial nerve. Okay, here's an example of a longitudinal fracture. You can see this is the axis of the petrous bone, and this is running, this fracture line is running perfectly perpendicular to the, uh, the axis of the petrous apex, right? There, here's the otocapsule, there's the superior semicircular canal. You can see that this is just going to dodge its way right around the otocapsule. Who would go through that dense uh, otocapsule if you could avoid it, if you could spare it and run around it? And, and this longitudinal fracture does exactly that. So this is a longitudinal fracture. It is otocapsule sparing, even though it's fairly displaced fracture. Remember that when you're dealing with these longitudinal fractures that run through the middle ear, the ossicles are at risk. Find that ice cream cone, right, the ice cream cone, and make sure that the ice cream's on the cone. This is an example where the, the ice cream has fallen off the cone. The head of the malleus has fallen off the body of the incus. There should be just a barely perceptible line of, of medium gray in between these two bones. Being able to see air in between them is absolutely abnormal. This is the malleoencuteal dislocation that you're looking for in these fractures. You can also get incutostopedial dislocation, but malleoencuteal dislocation way more common, and you're looking for this relationship. Don't forget to look for facial nerve involvement. This is a longitudinal fracture of the temporal bone, and it spares the otic capsule, but it just runs anterior here, right? And you can see that it's running right through where we expect the geniculate ganglion to be, so it would be unsurprising if this person had some facial nerve dysfunction. This is a critical finding because the surgeon now has to decide whether to try and decompress the facial nerve if there are clinical findings that correlate with that. Here's a transverse fracture, right? It's running perpendicular to the axis of the petrous bone, perpendicular to the axis, um, and it's running right through the otocapsule. Here's the vestibule, here's some semicircular canals, and just disrupting those blatantly with a displaced fracture running through the otocapsule. Otocapsule uh, violating fracture in transverse orientation. Don't forget, these transverse fractures, just like their longitudinal counterparts, can involve the facial nerve. They tend to involve the tympanic segment of the facial nerve rather than the geniculate ganglion when they run in this direction, um, but still the, the same problem of uh, as they violate the otic capsule running through the, the facial canal, also called the fallopian canal, and disrupting the facial nerve. Perilymphatic fistula is another potential complication of these otic capsule violating fractures. When you fracture between the uh, middle ear that's supposed to contain air and the inner ear that's supposed to contain endolymph and perilymph, they can leak into each other and you can get perilymph and endolymph in the middle ear where it reabsorbs and you can get gas in the, uh, in the membranous labyrinth. That's referred to as pneumolabyrinth. Um, and some surgeons prefer that term. It's a more descriptive term. But you can see the cochlea here that should be the same density as all the other fluid uh, is filled with gas because the, the normal uh, endolymph and, and perilymph have leaked out and gas has been permitted in. Pneumolabyrinth, perilymphatic fistula from an otic capsule violating fracture. Sometimes these temporal bone fractures can extend more inferiorly into the suture lines and cause diastasis of these sutures in the lower skull base. In particular, the occipitomastoid suture that runs just medial to the more, most inferior of the mastoid air cells, that can become diastased along with these temporal bone fractures.
you can imagine the risk that that poses to the sigmoid sinus. And here's an example of thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus. Even on unenhanced scans, we should be looking for this, uh, particularly when we have fractures that violate the sigmoid plate, that's the thin bone covering the sigmoid sinus. When we see fracture lines running back through here, but really anytime we're seeing a fracture of the temporal bone, we should be on the lookout for sigmoid sinus thrombosis. You don't necessarily need contrast to make this diagnosis because the thrombus should be denser than the surrounding intracranial contents, and you can see see thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus even without a CT venogram. Now, there are several normal anatomic structures that we encounter in the temporal bone that can look a little bit like fractures, and you don't want to fall for this pitfall. For example, here is a curvilinear structure running between the anterior and posterior limb of the superior semicircular canal. This is the subarcuate canal. It carries the subarcuate artery. In, in, in Europe and other parts of the world, this is sometimes called the petromastoid canal. In, in America, we call this the subarcuate canal. Uh, you can see why this might be mistaken for a fracture. It's curvilinear, it's running transverse through the otic capsule, uh, concerning appearance, but this is a normal structure. And if you look for it, you'll be able to find it in almost all of your patients as a normal structure. I have been a, 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 a legal expert in a medical case where these were called fractures in a patient who had undergone trauma. So this is definitely an error that can be, that, that is made by the unwary radiologist. Here's another normal anatomic structure that you should not mistake for a fracture. This is called the innominate canal. It runs from the posterior aspect of the internal auditory canal over to the vestibule. It is carrying a vestibular artery as it runs through there. Normal structure normal structure and should not be mistaken for a fracture. The key here is making sure that this line doesn't go any further. If this were a fracture, it would continue on. We talk about fracture planes continuing on through the anatomy. It wouldn't just run from here to here. The fact that this lucency runs such a short distance and is in this characteristic location will clue you in that this is actually the innominate canal and, uh, and, and you won't make the mistake of calling this a fracture. Here's another normal anatomic structure that you don't want to mistake for a temporal bone fracture. This line right here, this lucent line, uh, is running parallel to the internal auditory canal. Now, we're more inferior than the internal auditory canal, but we're running about the same course. This is the cochlear aqueduct, and you can see it heading towards the basal turn of the cochlea. It does the same thing the vestibular aqueduct does, helps to recycle the endolymph and perilymph. Uh, this is a normal anatomic structure, not a fracture. So that concludes our review of temporal bone fracture. The old terminology of longitudinal and transverse has been supplanted by the otocapsule violating and otocapsule sparing terminology. Uh, make sure that you're looking for secondary signs like the effusions and make sure that you're looking for things like diastasis and facial nerve involvement. Uh, and don't mistake normal anatomic structures for fractures.